We are continuing today our series on unlikely heroes, and today we're going to be talking about David. And the title for our message today is The Story of David's Courage and God's Forgiveness. And so speaking of forgiveness, you notice that's been our theme today. Maybe at one point in your life you've said something mean to someone and you asked their forgiveness. And let's say they say, okay, I'll forgive you. Now, while they're saying, I forgive you, would they do this? I forgive you. No, because when you forgive someone, that means you're not going to hurt them anymore. So we're going to see God's forgiveness in our story today. So go ahead and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. While you're turning there, let's, let's go ahead and pray before we start. Father, we thank you that we get to know you today from your word and see your amazing forgiveness. I pray that your power be on this message, that uh, our hearts would be open and ready to learn, and that you use it in our lives. Praise in your name. Like I said, we're in 1 Samuel 16, and let me give you some context before we jump in. So last week we talked about how Joshua took over Jericho, which was in the land of Canaan. So after he did that, they conquered almost the rest of Canaan, almost all of it, and then Israel set up themselves as a nation in Canaan. Now, during or after that time, the Israelites were being ruled by judges, who were ruling under God as the ultimate authority. But then, after a while, the Israelites said, you know what, all the other nations around us have human kings. We want one too. Kind of like if you're a kid and all your friends have bikes and you don't have one, what do you tell your parents? I want a bike, everybody else has one. That's what they're saying, they're saying, God, everybody else has a king, we want a king too. So God, appoints the first king, which is Saul, and he starts out great, but then he falls into pride, he falls into greed, and because of that, he turns away from God. So because of that, God is going to tell Samuel, who is a servant of God, he's going to tell him something he wants to do. So that's where we get to uh, our first point here, an introduction to David the underdog, 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. So look with me at verse 1 of chapter 16. It says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So stop there. What God is telling Samuel is, he's saying, I want a new king because of Saul going bad. So I want you to go somewhere. So Samuel says, okay. So God says, I want you to go to Bethlehem is a, a no-name city, and you would think God would say, I want you to find the most important person, or the ruler of Bethlehem, I want you to make one of his sons king. But no, he says, I want you to go to this man named Jesse, who's a shepherd, which position-wise, that's not the highest on the totem pole. It's kind of a no-name job. So he's telling him to go to a no-name city, to a no-name father with a no-name job, and so Samuel goes to do that. So we're going to read now verse 4 what Samuel does. So verse 4 says, And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, saying, Come thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord, Lord's anointed is before him. So stop there. So Samuel ends up going to Bethlehem. He finds Jesse and he says, I want to see your son. So Jesse brings his firstborn son, which back in the day and in that culture being the firstborn was a big deal. And so not only is he the firstborn, but evidently he also looks like a king on the outside. And he's thinking, oh, this, this is the guy. This guy is going to be the king. But you can't just tell from the outside, right? Because you could go to a business and you see this guy walking around and you're like, that guy's the boss. I can tell. And he might not be. It could be someone in shorts and a t-shirt, right? You, you can't tell on the outside who is what. So he thinks, on the outside, this guy's going to be king. Well, 
what does God say about this first born? Look at verse 7. It says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on, thy, on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel. And Samuel said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. So the reason God gives the reason here, and he says, I am not going to choose this firstborn because I look on the outside, and I don't look just on the outside, I also look on the inside. Kind of like if you're going to eat an apple and it looks great on the outside, but on the inside it looks like this, and you can't believe it's same like that. You don't know until you cut it open. God says, I can see the heart, so I don't want you to anoint him. So Samuel's like, okay, do you have any other sons? And Jesse says, okay. And so he brings seven, di seven different sons before Samuel, and Samuel says no to all of them. And notice that Jesse doesn't even consider having his youngest son go in front of Jesse. That, that didn't even occur, go before Samuel. Jesse didn't even consider that. So here's Samuel thinking, oh God, okay, God, are you, I mean, what's going on here? Tell me to see his son. This evidently is all his son. What's going on here? So because of this, just, or Samuel asked something. Look at verse 11. And Samuel asked unto Jesse, are you all thy children? And he said, all there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready and with all a beautiful countenance and was goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So Samuel says, Okay, is there any other sons? I mean, what's going on here? He's like, and Jesse's like, Oh, yeah, I, I guess there's David left. Uh, he's out with the sheep. So they bring him in, and Samuel sees him and says, This is the guy. This is the guy that God wants to be king. So, right from the start, you can see that David is an underdog because he's from a no name town with a no name father, with a no name job, and David is the last person that his no-name father would think could be king. He even didn't even consider showing Samuel David. So right from the beginning, he's an underdog. Now, one thing to note is that this doesn't mean that David is king right then. It's, he's saying here that God wants you to be the next king. Kind of like, let's say you buy frozen pizza, do you just take it out of the packaging and start eating it? No. No, it's, it's for later. So when he's anointing David, he's saying... All right, this, I'm anointing you saying I want you to be the next king. It's, it's for later. So David is an underdog from the start. Now that we've seen him introduced, we're going to look at one of the greatest things that David does. So the next point is the underdog, David versus Goliath. So turn with me to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. We're going to start in verse 1. 17 verse 1 says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shukok, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shukok and Ezekah in Epistemim. <laughs> and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they pitched by the valley of Elah, and set in battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the other side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. So here is Israel against their age-old enemy, which is the Philistines. And they're camped across from each other. Kind of like uh, if you have a high school or you have a school bully, like your age-old enemy. Well, the Philistines are the bully. They're the people that the Israelites have to keep on going up against. Well, while they are camped against each other, something happens. Look at verse 4. It says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. 
And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail on the weight of his legs and, and a, his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, beam and his spear had, had weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. So this tells us here about there is a warrior of the Philistines named Goliath. And it tells us that he's very well armed. He has a lot of armor and a lot of good weapons. So that in and of itself is a little scary, but what makes this really scary is it tells us about the height and strength of Goliath. And according to this, Goliath is about nine and a half feet tall. That's a little hard to gauge. So here's a picture of the tallest man in the world right now. This guy is eight feet tall, and you know these are normal size people. You know these aren't really small people. This guy is humongous, eight feet. Well, if he were to stand next to Goliath, he would have to tilt his head up. He would have to crane his neck to look at Goliath. That's how tall Goliath is. Now, and nowadays, if someone is super tall, like eight feet tall, that means they can barely move around, much less fight someone. Their body's just not meant to be that size. Well, it tells us here what kind of armor and weapons Goliath has, showing us how strong he is. So it says here that his armor was about 78 pounds. They say, is, is that a lot? Well, here is a picture of a Roman soldier a couple you know, hundred years after this. And the armor that he's wearing here is about 25 pounds. So when it says here in his armor, it's just talking about his chain vest. His chain vest by itself was 78 pounds. It says his spear was about 15 pounds, and an average spear around then is about 5 pounds. And then it said his sword was about 15 pounds. Now, a, a typical sword around that time period was about 3 pounds. And to help gauge this, I have one of my swords here. This is a two-handed broadsword. They didn't use these swords back then. This is, you know, middle, middle ages. But this is probably, I didn't measure it or weigh it, but it's probably between five and seven pounds. And for me to have to swing this around and fight with it with two hands, it's, it's pretty, you know, that's hard to do. Goliath had a 15-pound sword that he swung around with one hand. This guy was not only strong or tall, he was extremely strong. So that, that's pretty scary to have someone like that in the other army. So now that we've met Goliath, let's see what he says. Uh, look at verse 8. It says, And he, Goliath, stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines say, and the Philistines say, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. So here Goliath steps forward and he says, Okay, in order to settle this battle. I want you to bring one of your best soldiers to fight me, and whoever wins, the other army has to, has to surrender. So he says this to the Israelites, and how did the Israelites respond? Look at verse 11. It says, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So if you want to know what kind of emotions they were having, this kind of emotions. They were terrified, and do you blame them? Nine foot, nine and a half foot tall man, completely armored and huge and strong. Yeah, any one guy would be terrified to go up. I'd be terrified to go up against him with 20 guys, much less by myself. So they are terrified here. And so what's going to happen now is David is going to come upon the scene. And let's see what happens. Look at verse 22. It says, And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And he talked with them, and behold, there came up a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, 
Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he has come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and to make his father's house free in Israel. David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered and said after this manner, saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, what, what have I done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and sent for him. And Saul said to David, Let no man's heart fail because of it. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistines. So what happens is David is not a part of the Israelite army. At this point, he's probably about 16. He's still shepherding the sheep, but he comes up, and he sees Goliath, and he's making fun of the Israelites and the Israelite God. And David's first thoughts weren't, wow, that guy's scary, or wow, I can see why no one wants to fight him. He, he thinks, why isn't anybody standing up to him? How, how could you let Goliath say that about our God? And the people were like, do you see this guy? I mean, why do you think that we wouldn't go up and fight this guy? Well, then David says, okay, if you're not going to fight him, I'll fight him. And this is an either amazing faith or amazing stupidity. Kind of like, you know, if you see a guy doing this across the Grand Canyon, you're thinking, wow, that guy is stupid. Well, that's what the people were thinking about David. Wait, you, you're 16, you're not part of this army, you want to fight that guy? Well, David goes up to Saul and says, I want to fight Goliath. And here's what Saul says. Look at verse 33. It says, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go up against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And, and David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took out a lamb of the flock. And I went out after him, and I smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and I slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be one of them, seeing that he defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Saul armed David with his armor, and he put on a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. So David goes up to Saul and says, I'm going to fight Goliath. And I, I think, I wasn't there, obviously, but I think Saul might have thought he was kidding at first. Like, oh. That's funny, David. But David's like, no, I, I, I want to go fight this. I want to go fight Goliath. And so David tells Saul that he killed this bear. He killed this lion. God helped him do that. And he's going to help him kill Goliath. And this took a lot of faith on Saul's part because the how his army was going to either die or live was depending on the guy he chooses. And he says, okay, David. I believe that you and our God can go defeat Goliath. So he says, here, take, take this shield, take this helmet. And David says, no, I, I'm not going to take those. So David declines those weapons. What weapons does he choose? Well, um, look at verse 41. Or I'm sorry, look at verse 40. It says, and he took his staff in hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. 
So what David's choice of weapon was a sling and five stones, which was a valid weapon in that day and age. But when you're going up a whip against a well-armored giant, it's like going up with a BB gun against a tank. I mean, this, this is a little crazy that David is just going up against this Goliath with, with just a uh, sling. Well, after David gets his weapons, look at verse 41. This is what happens. It says, And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And the Philistine looked out and saw David. He disdained him, for he was but a youth and a ruddy and a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou defy. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and will take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the, the, carcasses of the, host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So Goliath comes up to David, and he sees this 16-year-old boy with just a sling, and he laughs. I mean, imagine if you go up to one of your friends and say, I want to fight you. And he says, okay, let, let, me, let me send someone in to fight for me. And this is who he sends in. His two-year-old son, you would laugh, you're thinking, are you kidding? Well, that's what Goliath's thinking. The 16-year-old boy with just a sling is going to go against me? This is laughable. And so he starts making fun of David, he starts makes, making fun of Israel's God. And so what does David do? He comes right back at him. He starts saying, you know what? I know I don't have the weapons, I know I don't have the strength, but I have God on my side. I, I have the Lord of hosts. And he is going to help me conquer you and your heart. And I think that settled well with Goliath. Well, look what Goliath does. Look at verse 48. It says, And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. That that stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in his hand. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So what happens here is after Goliath hears David take his remarks and just throw it right back in his face. Goliath angrily runs forward towards David. Now, can you imagine the sound of a nine and a half foot giant with hundreds, hundred pounds of armor and, and weapons on him running at you? That would be terrifying. Most people would turn around and run, but not only did David not just stand his ground, he ran at him. And he was swinging his sling, he he threw the stone from his sling, hit Goliath in the head, knocked him over. And while Goliath is dazed, he takes Goliath's sword, takes it out of his sheath, and cuts off his head. And because of that, the Philistine army runs. Now imagine you were there and saw this 16-year-old teenager defeat Goliath. I think you'd be having uh, this kind of emotion, right? <laughs> I mean, what just happened? But look at how much glory God got from this. A 16-year-old boy only having a sling, not a part of the army, hasn't been trained in the art of war, defeats a giant who has been doing this his whole life. Unbelievable what God can do, even with an underdog like David. So that's one of the greatest things that David does in his life. But it doesn't stop there. Let me give you some summary of what else happens in David's life. If you look up here on the screen, uh, we see... Uh, 1 Samuel 18 through 31, that Saul tries to kill David many times. 
So because of what David has done, and everybody starts rallying around David, and Saul finds out that David has been anointed to be the next king, Saul tries to kill David over and over and over again. So for a long time, David is running from his life. But then, in 2 Samuel 5, it says David is made king, and David defeats the Philistines. So David becomes king, and then right away he defeats this, this bully of the Philistines. And then, in 2 Samuel 8 through 10, it says David defeats all of Israel's enemies. So, not only does he defeat Goliath, not only does he defeat the Philistines, he defeats all of Israel's enemies. So this is God using him greatly to do these amazing things. But then unfortunately, 2 Samuel 8 through 10, David commits adultery with Bathsheba and then kills her husband. Now because of this, the next part we're going to look at is Nathan rebukes David. So turn with me to 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12. What's happening here is, like we said, David commits adultery with Bathsheba and kills her husband to cover his sin. So what happens is, God sends Nathan unto David. Nathan is a prophet from God, meaning that God speaks directly to Nathan and through Nathan. And this is what um, Nathan says unto David. Look at verse 1. It says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one ewe lamb which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him, with his children, and did eat of his own meat, and drank his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and it was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the to dress for the wavering man that came unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed for the man that was come to him. So Nathan comes up to David and tells David a story, and David assumes that this story is true. And the story that Nathan tells David is that there was this rich man who had lots of flocks, lots of sheep, and there was this poor man who had one sheep, and he loved the sheep so much that he would let it sleep with him at night. He considered it his child. And one day, this stranger came to the rich man, and the rich man needed a lamb to feed this stranger. And instead of killing one of his lambs, the rich man's lamb, he takes the one lamb of the poor man and kills it to feed the stranger. And when David hears this, this is what he said. This is what he uh, says. Look at verse 5. It says, that David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done these things shall surely die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, because he had no pity. So when David hears this story, he is furious. He says, Who is this man? Tell me who it is. I want him dead. Because, I mean, Imagine if someone came into your house and killed your pet. You'd be a little angry, right? So it makes sense that David is angry. So he is furious that this man did this. But then Nathan turns to David and says something that probably sent chills down David's spine. Look at verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if it had been too little, I would have moreover given unto these such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain with the sword the children of Ammon. So after David gets all upset, saying, who is this guy? Nathan turns to him, looks at him, and says, you are this man. Meaning that God has given David all these good things. He was so rich, had so much. And here's Uriah, who has one wife, and loves her dearly. And what does David do? He takes her for himself and kills her husband. Horrible thing to do. Now remember, we talked about that Saul was the king before David. And Saul started out great, just like David, but then when he got into his sin, 
He just turned from God and never looked back. What is David's response to being confronted with this sin? Well, first and second Samuel doesn't tell us this, but in Psalm 51 tells us his response. So turn to Psalm 51. The last point we're going to look at today is David's repentance. Psalm 51, 1 through 12. Psalm 51, verse 1, this is what David says. Talking to God, he says, Have mercy upon me. And then go to verse 2. He says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And go to verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, and the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, of thy salvation, and uphold me with me thy free spirit. So David's response to this, he acknowledges that he sinned, and he asks for God's mercy. And remember, we've talked about mercy is not giving what we deserve. So God is not giving David what he deserves. So what kind of things, what kind of mercy is David asking for? Well, in this, he asks for God to wash him from his sin, make it so that he can hear and feel joy again, and renew a right spirit in him. So from what David said, if we were to go up to him and ask him, so are you very happy with this sin? Are you very happy with this choice? What do you think he would say? No. He's saying, this sin is hurting me. It is draining the joy from my life. God, please forgive me and have mercy on me. Let's remember, when Nathan told David his story about a man that killed the other man's sheep, what did he say should happen to that guy? He should die for killing another man's sheep. David committed <coughs> adultery and then killed that guy's, or he killed Uriah, the husband. In David's definition, did he deserve mercy? No. What, is, what else does David say with this? Go back to verse 1. David says this, O oh God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. What David is saying here, David is saying, I know I don't deserve mercy, but I know that you are a loving and merciful and forgiving God. Please forgive me. And what we know from the rest of his story is that God does forgive David. He does give David mercy. So in conclusion, have you experienced God's forgiveness in your life? Meaning that we have sin in our life that we make it, making it so that we are separated from God. We can't go to heaven when we die. But if we ask forgiveness, God can and will take all those <coughs> sins away. As we put our faith in Jesus to be our Savior, we can be right with God and go to heaven when we die. So if you've not done that, please come talk to me. We can talk more about that. Now in this series, we're showing how God uses unlikely heroes. David, from the very beginning, was an underdog. From a no-name town, with a no-name father, with a no-name occupation. And that father thought that David was the last person that should have been the king out of his sons. So as an underdog, God chooses David. And David chooses to step out in faith and believe that God can do great things through him. And he steps out in faith against a, a nine and a half foot giant. Has faith in God and God does this amazing thing. And then as we talk about God did amazing thing after amazing thing after amazing thing with David. So let me ask you, what is your giant? What is something in your life that you feel like you cannot overcome by yourself? It could be, uh, it could be uh, a, thing, uh, a thing you have to accomplish in your life, but you don't know how you're going to do it. It could be forgiving a person. It could be a sin that's dominating your life, and you're thinking, I cannot overcome this. I cannot defeat this. God can. 
God is bigger than that problem. Just like God was bigger than Goliath, he's bigger than that problem in your life. So I encourage you, that, that giant in your life, to say, God, I trust you and I know that you can overcome this. And I'm going to step out in faith and I'm excited to see you do these things and overcome this in my life. And then another thing we've been looking at in our series is the different characteristic of God shown in, this, in these stories. And today, in this story, we saw God's forgiveness. And it's obviously what David did was a horrible thing. We acknowledge that. But what makes it even more horrible is who David did that sin against. Because it wasn't just against Uriah. It wasn't just against Bathsheba. What made it awful was that he did it against a holy God. Someone that is completely sinless. And when you sin, when he sinned, it was personally attacking God. Kind of like, let's say that you buy a brand new white suit or something like that. I don't even know if that's inside. But let's say you wore completely white and someone comes up to you and douses you with mud. And your brand new suit never ruins it. You'd be upset. Or you can think about it like, let's say you have a wound and someone comes up and throws something in it to make it sting on purpose. That's just a small aspect of what it's like when someone sins against God. Against a perfectly holy God. It is awful for God. But yet, as David asked forgiveness, God said, you know what? I forgive you. I love you, and I'm going to give you mercy. So I encourage you, if, if there is a sin in your life right now that is draining your joy, meaning that it is just dominating your life, where, where you are just serving it, you're giving into it over and over and over again, I encourage you to come before God and ask forgiveness. Because God is ready and wanting to forgive you of that sin and to also help uproot that sin from your life. Kind of like if you have a, a garden, you have to uproot the weeds. God can help you uproot that weed of sin in your life. And what's amazing, like we talked about with God being like the father of the prodigal son, when we ask forgiveness, not like God's like, oh, I can't. He says, no, I'm going to run out to you. I'm going to hug you. I'm going to forgive you. Because I love you. And then when you also think about in the case of David, that does God know the future? Yes. So when, did, when God picked David to be the next king and to do all these great things with him, do you think Dave, God knew that David was going to mess up this bad in the future? Absolutely. But maybe you're here today and you, you say, I've done too much for God to truly use me. I, I've messed up too much. That is never the case. God is in the business of using broken people. I mean, just think about the people we've talked about so far in this series. Joseph, proud. You have Rahab, prostitute. Moses was a murderer. God is in the business of using broken people. So praise the Lord that we have such a forgiving God that forgives our sin over and over again. He empowers us to be able to defeat the giants in our life. Let's pray. Father, we are just so thankful for your forgiveness. And that you forgive us from our sin. I pray if there's anybody here that has not accepted you to be their Savior and had their sins forgiven, that they would take care of that today. Seeing that they have to have that in order to have a relationship with you and to go to heaven when, when they die. Father, I pray that you would um, convict any of us of here, even that are saved, that if there's a sin that we are serving that is dominating our life, whether it be serving an idol or just things that are against the Bible, that you would show us how empty, how that robs our, us of our joy. May we come to you, ask forgiveness, and know the joy and peace of having that sin forgiven and knowing that you can and will uproot that sin out of our life and rejoy the, and restore the joy in our life. Father, we just thank you that you give us power to overcome giants in our life, whether it be needing to forgive someone, hurt circumstance, a financial problem, a physical problem, 
whether it be a, a sin dominating our life, it could be anything. Thank you that you are bigger than that problem. You're bigger than that giant in our life. And that as we trust you, we can see you do great things and overcome those giants in our life. We thank you that you are powerful and forgiving. Praise in your name.